Welcome to the Gary DeMar Show. Your 15 minutes of sanity each weekday. Four out of five doctors surveyed recommend this show, along with a large dose of common sense to help combat the insanity served up by the mainstream media. And now, with today's daily recommended allowance of rationality, here's Gary DeMar. Welcome to today's show. This is part two of my response to a critique that William Lane Craig gave on preterism. And as I mentioned in uh, the previous uh, show, that um, uh, this isn't a fully developed exposition from Dr. Uh, Dr. Craig's uh, p- um, position, uh, but it's, it's a part of a, a lecture that he was given and someone was kind enough to transcribe it for me. So this is a word-for-word transcription. And as I mentioned, I would love to sit down with Dr. Craig and discuss these things further. Uh, because I think there's much more to this uh, to this debate than he either realizes or just decided not not to deal with. I think there's some more preliminary issues that have to be dealt with here that are not brought up. Um, and again, uh, just to, just to very quickly to go over this, he talks about the idea of coming and that there's the first the the grammatical argument that deals with the idea of the perspective of the observer. And so when someone says is that Jesus is going to come, uh, you would expect that coming to be to you. And, and I, I would agree with that. But that's not what is going on here. What is the biblical nature of the coming that's spoken of here? It's not enough that we, put our, that we evaluate uh, coming in terms of how we perceive of all of this, but how is the Bible approaching the issue of coming? And I, the first place I, I, I took us was back to Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1. It's obvious from Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, that this coming that's, that, that is happening here is related to those who live in Egypt. Uh, and the one coming here is the Lord who's riding on a swift cloud, and he says, is about to come to Egypt. So there's a time element here is about to. This isn't something in the distant future, but this was something that was to take place with, within the, the, peri- the period of time when the Egyptians of the Old Testament were alive. And this is the gen- generally the perspective that's taken by most modern commentaries and even older commentaries. And listen to this next part. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. And again, if you take, take the position that this has to be a physical coming of Jehovah down to earth, riding on a cloud, getting off of that cloud, and then at his very presence, the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them and the idols will tremble, then you're stuck with all kinds of, of, of theological problems here. And the majority of commentators simply recognize this as a language that deals with, the, with, uh, with, the ju- with, with judgment. And there's another passage uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, it is in the book of Micah. And Micah chapter 1 uh, gives something very similar. It says, uh, verse 2, uh, Micah chapter 1, verse 2, Hear, O peoples, all of you, listen, o, o earth, and all it contains, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So, there, so here is the place where the Lord is. He is in his holy temple. Now, if this is the earthly temple here, well, it's obvious that the Lord was not physically present at, at, at this earthly temple. If he's talking about uh, the, the heavenly, heavenly temple, then again the issue is this is, this is something where the, where the Lord is. For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. He will come down. So here's the, the direction is very, very clear. And tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him and the valleys will be split. So again, the perspective here is, is that the people are on earth and the Lord is going to come down. The question is, is he coming down physically so that they can actually see him with their own eyes? Uh, there's no indication that that's the case here. Uh, but what is indicated here, that they will see the effects of this coming and that effect will be in judgment. And the language here is quite apocalyptic. Uh, he will tread on the high places of the, of the earth or the land the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will be split like wax before the fire. 
like water poured down a steep place. And this is for the rebellion of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. So this is obviously a judgment coming. And yet, again, I don't know of any, any particular um, a prophecy writer who looks at this, this passage and says this is the physical coming of Jehovah down to, down to earth and all of these things are going to happen just like they're stated here. Uh, so again, while the perspective is right here, the perspective is earth, uh, the nature of this coming is different from what we would generally say a, the, the coming of Jesus is. Now let's go into the New Testament a little bit and let's look at Revelation chapter 2 verse 5. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation deal with seven churches in Asia Minor. This first one is to the church at Ephesus. And listen to what verse 5 says. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Now, again, uh, this, this Ephesian church isn't a church in the distant future. This is a church that was in existence in the first century. What is the nature of this coming? It is, is it a physical coming of Jesus to that particular church? Would Jesus have shown up in that church physically? Now, I'm not saying that's impossible, but it's probably very unlikely. And even, again, a number of dispensational writers would not go that far. Uh, Robert Thomas, who, who wrote a, an exhaustive commentary in the book of Revelation in two volumes published by Moody, sees this as related to the second coming. I, I don't see this at all. Uh, this is, this is a, a localized judgment, a promise of a judgment coming, unless you repent. You go a little further, verse 16, uh, and uh, another church, it reads, Repent, therefore, else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. And so here's another uh, threat of a judgment coming, to a local church in Asia Minor in the first century when the book of Revelation was written. And so now, what, what is the nature of this coming? Again, the issue is judgment. Repent, therefore. I will make war against them with the word of my mouth. Uh, so th this isn't a visible coming either, even though the perspective here is the, pers the, the perspective of a particular church at that particular time. Um, one other place you will see in Revelation chapter 3, verse verse 3, the church of uh, to Sardis. This is the message to the church of Sardis. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and, and keep it, and repent. Again, the issue of judgment here. If therefore you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know of what hour I will come upon you. And this, this is language that's generally attributed to what we would call the second coming of Christ. But here again, this is a local judgment. It's a coming judgment. The perspective is earth. And again, if you were to take this in a very, I hate to use the word literal way, you would expect to follow what Dr. Craig is saying here and other prophecy writers, that this has to be a physical coming of Jesus down to earth at that particular church. But again, the majority of commentators don't see it like this at all. Uh, that this is, in fact, a reference to a judgment coming. Uh, now, so, I, I, again, I understand the perspective issue here, the grammatical side of all of this. I think it misses a, a broader point, and the broader point is, is how, does the, how does the Bible, both Old and New Testament, deal with certain judgment coming events? Uh, they, they, they don't, they, they don't uh, require... A physical presence of, of God in the Old Testament, uh, they, as we saw in the book of Revelation, they don't require a physical presence of Jesus. Uh, and yet, in, in both cases, in, well, in Isaiah chapter 19, Micah chapter 1, and in Revelation uh, chapter 2 and 3, we see this coming down, the threat of judgment, uh, the, the, pre the presence of, 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 of Jehovah and in Jesus in the New Testament, and yet, again, I don't know of any particular uh, scholar who would see these as the second coming of Christ, ex except for someone like Robert Thomas, which I think he is just wrong. Even John Walvoord uh, sees these as, uh, as, as judgment comings, the one in, in, the, in the book of Revelation. So uh, keep this, all this in mind in this particular idea. The issue of perspective is important, and I'm not disputing the issue of perspective. 
I am disputing is the nature of the coming, which, which Dr. Craig does not deal with. He doesn't deal with any of these particular passages. Now, uh, he goes on to deal with the a passage in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, actually, yeah, Matthew chapter 24 and in Mark chapter 13. And, uh, but let's use the one in, Mar in Matthew chapter 24 because it is a bit more complete than Mark 13. He quotes Mark 13, 26, and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Uh, and he makes reference to this idea of they means that the people that they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and glory will be a visible, observed coming. Again, with what we've seen with the background of, of uh, Isaiah and Micah and Revelation chapters 2 and 3, that isn't necessarily the case because the Egyptians were to see this as well. They were to tremble at his presence. Uh, but I think there's some broader issues here. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 and Mark 13, which the passage that, that Dr. Craig uh, quotes, and Luke chapter 21, the passage uh, is sandwiched between uh, the Jesus' prediction about the destruction of the temple early in the chapter and this generation not passing away until all these things take place. And remember, in Matthew chapter 24, uh, verse 30, uh, Jesus says, uh, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the land will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, this is sandwiched between the passage re regarding the prediction of the end of the age and the destruction of the temple, not one stone left upon another, and verse 34, which says, Truly I say to you, his present audience, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Verse 33 states emphatically, Even so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. And so the passage regarding the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds, on the clouds of heaven, uh, it takes place before that particular generation passes away. Now, Dr. Craig doesn't deal with that argument, uh, and it is, it is the foundation of the preterist argument that Jesus was predicting something that was going to take place within that particular generation. And, and again, we're back to the nature of this coming that Jesus refers to here. And uh, again, in, in the comments. On this, on this passage that I've got from this transcription, no reference is made to where that particular passage that Jesus quotes comes from. Uh, and Jesus is actually quoting from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, and here we get the perspective. Here, we, here, here we're told where this coming takes place. The perspective uh, isn't, isn't uh, so much the, the, the people. The perspective is first God, uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a man, uh, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So Jesus is quoting this particular passage, and the coming here is obviously a coming up to the Ancient of Days. Uh, the, whether you say coming up to or going to, it doesn't matter. We know that the destination point here is, in fact, the Ancient of Days, that Jesus is going up to the Ancient of Days. This isn't a coming down to earth, this is going up to. So the perspective here is very clear. Now we'll come back to this in our, in, in our, our next talk to deal with, uh, with some other issues related to this because it's important to understand the issue of the ascension, uh, which Dr. Craig mentions here, uh, and, uh, but do he doesn't deal with this particular passage in the, the Olivet Discourse found in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, and Luke chapter 21. He doesn't deal with uh, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. He doesn't deal with, uh, with Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 as the place where Jesus uh, borrows this particular passage and, uh, and uh, identifies himself with it. And we'll see this later on how important this is in, in Matthew chapter 26. So that for tomorrow's uh, show, what you might want to do is to look at Matthew chapter 26 verse 64 and, to, and to, to get some idea of the effect that Jesus quoting that particular passage has on his, his religious opposition. We'll see you tomorrow and we'll continue this discussion.